childhood is a problem, but does not approach is a source of sorrow. That means that if I don't grow, I'll become a source of sorrow. children you think about them that oh can I do this again yes or no you need to weigh your options before you make decisions you know as you were speaking let me just yeah. as, as you were speaking you know I don't know why they harass people about insurance MOT road tax who needs it? You, at least you can drive, isn't it? Without those things. I, do you know what? I really think it's a rip-off by the government, personally. Yeah? I think it's a rip-off. Because it's only the government that gets anything out of it. No. Uh, it's for your good. The important thing is for you to ensure that the car is fit for the road. So you don't have an accident. It's for your safety. That's for you. For all the road users. Yes. But most importantly, it's not for the government going to wear yeah. this. That's not even for the government at all. Road tax, road tax, road tax, it goes straight to the government. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we don't, there's no, there's no benefit. It's a rip off, isn't it? But they clean the road, they do the potholes. It's like the potholes are not bad. Road tax, road tax, road tax. They have a part of it. You know, like the nice rates. Yeah. Is it, it, let me tell you, the whole thing is a con, is a rip off. Do you, do, you know, do you know what is interesting? I deliberately said that. You know why? Because sometimes we think we're doing something for somebody. Eh? No, it's true. Just you think this road tax is them, insurance is them, MOT is them. Who gets in the car? <laughs> With who? Your family, isn't it? Uh -huh. Go to countries where they don't pay road tax. Roads are killing people like rabbits every day. Uh oh, we're on TV. Uh, <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, if the car is not fit for the road, whose life are you endangering? Yours, your, yours, your family, and other people on the road. But well, you, number one. Okay, all right. If you don't pay road tax, then why complain about the, the bumps on the road, the potholes, all the things that are wrong with the road and so on. There's some roads you cannot access and some places you discover. So road tax is also for our safety and for our own well-being. Yeah? Insurance is for who? For me. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> so in short, it is all for our own what? Good. Hallelujah. But now, the reason why I bring back that is this, yeah? When you have children, all the instruction in the Word of God and all the things that God says that we must do, so things, all the guidelines and so on, they're not for God. They're not for anybody's benefit. They're for our own personal benefit. Are we together? Okay. An interesting thing is this, everywhere in the Bible, the Bible, especially in Proverbs, they say, my child, listen to this because it will keep you from. So the commandments of God, yeah, are actually for who? Ourselves. You know, so we're the highest benefactors. God doesn't benefit, but of course, it grieves every parent if their child misses the way. Amen. So in Jesus' name, the road tax, MOT, Insurance is all for our own good. So also, when we have children and God says to us, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that, 
it is for us and for our children's benefit. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So that is why um, being here tonight, you're not doing anybody any favor but yourself. Amen? Amen. Praise God. It is, it is, it is our soul. For those who are, let me tell you what is good here. The people who are at the highest place of advantage are those who do not yet have children and you're still young. Because you're hearing this thing now before you start. You know, some of us is A and E that we're still working, we're still at A and E, accident and emergency department, trying to fix things here and there because we have all, you know, your panel beating and putting and just carry go, you know. But if you haven't had children yet, you are definitely wise, the wisest person in this room. Because for you to come, that means that you're believing God that in the future I will do it right and I will get it right. And I will get a 100% return on what I'm going to enter into. Her wisdom is of no value after, in hindsight. Wisdom, the value of wisdom is in foresight, is in beforehand. You know, if I want to say in hindsight, it means you've already missed it. That you know the answer to the question after the exam is of, <laughs> is of no benefit. Amen. So praise God. So I'm really excited to see those who don't yet have children. You know, because a foolish person will say, well, I don't have children. I don't need to be here. No, you're actually wiser than the wisest. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Okay. Um, we're going to go quickly into a couple of things. Okay. Okay. Um, the, the parent of all parents is who? God. God. Hallelujah. Amen. So if you're going to understand parenting, then you must learn from the grandmaster of all. Are we together? Okay. Who is the son of all sons or children of children? Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. If you're going to learn how to be the greatest child in the world, you've got to watch and look at Jesus. If you're going to look at the greatest relationship between a, a parent and a child, then you look at the relationship between God the Father and God the Son. Hallelujah. Amen. So those two are our number one role models in terms of understanding. Then afterwards, God will help us through his word to go to some actual natural lifetime examples, you know, through. Yesterday night, we looked at a couple of individuals, a few individuals, isn't it? And one of the people that we looked at was Eli. You know, how if you don't do what you ought to do, when you ought to do it, because every task is time limited. Every assignment is within a time frame. It's important to know this, you know. So when you have those seven questions, what is it, why is it, when, where. When means what is my time frame. You know, because the truth is this, you don't have a lifetime for parenting. Parenting is within a window of time. That is why Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 6, but if you take verse 5 and 6, Ecclesiastes, okay, it says something very important. More so, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, the whole of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and specifically verse 11, okay, Okay, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, okay, verse 5 and 6. What does it say? Have we looked at it? What does it say? (coughs) 
my one says, those who obey him will not be punished. Those who are wise will find a time and a way to do what is right. Mm. For there is a time and a way for everything, mm -hmm. even when a person is in trouble. Mm. Hallelujah. Praise God. But what, what the Bible is saying to us is there is a particular time frame and a particular judgment to everything. Okay? You don't have forever to do parenting. Okay? There is a window of time. There is a window of time. There is a time when you do something that even though it is right, but because it has gone past its season, it no longer has value. So you're doing the right thing, but at the wrong time. It also amounts to doing zero or nothing. Is, is this making sense? Yeah? Everything to do with God. God lives outside of time. He lives in eternity. But human beings live within time. And that is why two scriptures, Psalm 90 verse 12, Psalm 39 verse 4 and 5, are very crucial. Okay? What are those scriptures? Check it in your Bible and take note of it. Okay? Psalm 90 verse 12. Teach us to do what? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Okay. <clears throat> and then 39 verse 4, 5 and 6. What does it say? Use your mic, yeah? Please use your mics. Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Mm -hmm. Remind me that my days are numbered, mm. how fleeting my life is. You have made my life no longer than the width of my heart. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. Mm. At best, each of us is but a breath. Hallelujah. Six, we are merely moving shadows and all our busy rushing ends in nothing. We heap up wealth, not knowing who will spend it. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. And, and that brings us to an important thing that parenting, okay, what, us being here, is time limited okay parenting or parenting is time limited whether we like it or not yeah we live within a certain time frame there's a it's not Christian but the principle is correct it says strike the iron while it is what hot that's right okay and in the same way, the Bible says, discipline your child yeah, promptly and in a timely way while there is still time so that you will not end up having to become the person that will bury them before time. Okay? Um, can I just ask you to just quickly have a look for that scripture? Yeah? Proverbs 19, 18 says, 
Discipline and teach your son while there is hope, mm -hmm. and do not indulge your anger or resentment by imposing inappropriate punishment, nor desire his destruction. That's right. Okay. <clears throat> in, in the Amplified Bible, it says, Discipline your son while there is hope. But do not indulge your angry resentments by undue chastisements and set yourself to his ruin. Okay? Which means that what you should have done when, it, when the child was young and tender, when you don't do it then, afterwards you will now be acting out of frustration and anger and then ruin the child. Okay? So when they're still very young, there's some things you must do. Because every day, the window of opportunity is closing. Every day, the window of opportunity is closing. Yeah. Once those windows close, then you will have to use force and vigor to begin to try and force and in impose those things. By then, it's too late. Amen. So it's important to bear that in mind that is, there is a time frame with it, okay? I want you to um, note these. I, I use it in, 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 in staff development, okay? And it is something that is very useful to bear in mind, okay? And it is this. What is my job description as a parent? Number one, you want to do a table, okay? I don't know if you can create a table. It's just a table. Let me tell you what is interesting. When I said I was, I was, I was teaching today, the reason why I'm sitting down is because I am so tired, okay? I've been teaching since 10 o'clock this morning, okay? And I remember where I was, I was teaching on some. I said, we're going to draw a table. Draw a table, and on that table, I was actually about to teach on this particular principle. I looked at somebody's <laughs> piece of paper and they were drawing a table, you know, with four legs. <laughs> I had to um I had to say no 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 I didn't mean draw a table. A really nice table they were drawing. Very nice, correct. <laughs> Is that what you were doing? <laughs> Well, well, it's you need columns. You need you need to have at least six columns to it. Okay, you need at least to have six columns. Okay, on that table. So you draw a line, a horizontal line, and then six vertical columns. Okay. Number one is the job description. Okay, you need six columns. So yeah. Okay. All right. Hallelujah, Coco. You, 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 column is like this. Yeah, you. <laughs> Those are rows. Rows, rows are like this. Columns are like that. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Don't worry. It's as well. Me too. It took me a while to figure it out. Okay. So, number one, number one is job description. Okay? What is my job description? The job description. Number two, second column, is the policy and guidelines policy and guide but what i use there is biblical guidelines policy and biblical guidelines okay third column is your task detail task detail third column is task detail Fourth column, okay, is, are we together? Fourth column, are you still at the first one? Number one is job description. Number two is what? Policy and biblical guidelines. Number three? Task of detail, okay. Number four, okay, is process and procedures. Process and just put in bracket 
the way. The way. The way is synonymous with when I asked, when I mentioned before about the how. Yeah, so it's not just about what you do, but how you, you did it. For example, Esther, okay, can sit here, okay, she can look at me, and when she looks at me, I just say, oh, oh man, she must be in love with me. Eh? And then, the way she looks at me, I'll just slap her. Why? What's, what's wrong with you? You're being rude. It's the same eye, but the way that it was used. Does that make sense? One eye will say, ah, this child is very humble. Oh, she must really love me. I, wow, wonderful girl, lovely. Another way she will look. You, wow, why are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> Same eye. Am I making sense? So the how is crucial. Okay? You give your child, tell your child, go and do this. There's a way the child will, when they're leaving, you say, come back here, come back here, come back here. Kneel down there. The child said, but I'm going to go and do it. No, it's not because. It's because with the way you carried your eye when I told you to go and do that thing. Maybe first of all, you look at the ceiling. Then you look down. And then you walk away like that. You see, it tells me that that's an insult. You didn't say anything. But just the way you carried your eye. Mama, is that not true? Yeah, praise God. You know, so how is critical. The how. Okay, so the way in which it is done. Okay, all right. Typically, in marriage relationships, what causes problems is not what was said, it was the way she said it. Is it not true? <laughs> okay, <laughs> amen. Okay, so we've got that. And then the next column, okay, how many columns do you have there now? Okay, okay, so the next column, you, you ask it resources. Yeah. Resources required. Resources required. Okay. And then finally, in the last column, you put your time frame. Today, I, I, I said you put time and frequency, okay? Timing and frequency, okay? All right? Praise God. So that is for parenting, okay? So what are the columns? Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> okay? Because for every job and every assignment, how many people have worked anywhere before? Yeah? For any job and every assignment that you're given, those are six things that you must be clear about. Otherwise, you will fail or you will not achieve maximum result. Does that make sense? Okay? You must know what is your job description in this place. What is required of me? Number two, you must also know what the policies and procedures that govern and inform your assignment, what you've been given. You must also know after that, what are the details of this task? Okay? Then you must also know the how and, you know, how do you want it done? So when I tell you, can I have tea, a cup of tea, what are you going to say to me? Pardon? How would you like it? You want sugar? How many sugars, isn't it? You want milk? How much milk do you want it? Okay. You want herbal or thank you? De well, is that decaffeinated? I thought it was coffee. Okay, so there's decaf, okay, whichever one, and so on and so forth. Okay. If you just go and you go and get me, okay, let me say this thing. God is very particular about this issue. 
Yeah? It can determine the difference between what is accepted and unaccepted. Okay? Because God is very particular about process and procedure, how things are done. Okay? It makes all the difference. Most parents will do the same thing, but how they do it will determine what results come out with the children. And that's the absolute truth. Every parent has a desire to bring out the best for their children. But how you go about doing it will end up determining the final result. Are we together? Okay. So it's very important to do so. And you need to know also what are okay, the resources that I have at my disposal. Because you need to know what the tools, tools and resources you have to be able to help you to achieve the task. Okay? And you need to know what are your time frames and what are the frequencies of this thing. How often do I need to do this? When do I need to do this? Yeah? So that you can accomplish it. Praise God. Okay? So that is a, a brief breakdown. We shall come back to these things. Okay? But what I would like us to do now is to just find somebody who is not your regular friend, okay? Not your regular friend, yeah, okay? I, I know you have, because it's easy to go to your best friend, okay? So go to somebody who you don't live in the same house with them, and you don't normally talk, you don't really know them, or whatever it may be. You know them, you see them, but they're not your body-body kind of person, okay? So hook up with that person, okay? And find out from them, okay? All right? You haven't moved yet, okay? Okay. 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 And in looking at those things, yeah, I want you to have a discussion, okay, about today what which 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 of these areas do I need the most help with and why? Okay? Which of these areas do I really need help with or I would benefit from? Am I really interested? I'm hoping that today I would and why? Okay? Look at those six columns, okay? And what I want you to have a discussion with that person. What, what do these mean for you? And what is it that I, would, that, I, that I can say that I would really benefit from today and why that particular area or areas are really important to me for today, okay?
One more minute. Okay, this is what we're going to do, okay? What you're going to do now is you're going to tell us what your partner said. Uh -huh. so, that, uh, so that we shall see how good we are as, at listening as parents. Praise God. So, you will tell me what Dami told you, what she said. Uh, no, 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 that's, that's all right, don't worry. So you're going to have to say what the other person told you. Okay. Praise God. <clears throat> um, one thing that we started with was the fact that um, if we don't know the job description, it will be hard to do the rest of the columns. So we, we started off with that, and Demi was um, saying that with the job, job district, um, description, description, the first would be train to train our children to train my child, um, communicate with the child uh, consistently, discipline the child, protect and to provide, and uh, supervise. <laughs> and um, in terms of the policy, 
and um, biblical guideline. Uh, we put down Proverbs 22, 6. That's, you know, train the child in the way, in the way he should go. And when he grows up, he won't depart from it. Um, and help. Okay. <laughs> very well. Uh, all right. Okay, let's please what did Pastor T tell you? <laughs> 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 Just but you guys are Take, take the mic, yeah? Okay, tell us what. We speak about job description um, that is the responsibility of a parent for a child, to bring up the child. Um, Pastor was saying it's about um, what you patrol is like, what the child see in you is what they actually mean. Then the other one is... Um, we speak about tasks, which is our responsibility. The task is to um, to to bring them forward, feed them, clothe them, nurture them, love them, protect them, and stuff like that. And then we spoke about um, time frame, where we spoke about. Um, the time frame is that we bring them up to a certain time and then when they depart from us, I mean, they never leave anyway. You're always coming back. <laughs> 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 yeah, and you want anything else, lad? Mm. Okay. All right. You see, that th this thing here, um, while it's, it's used in management and leadership and everything, okay, but the truth is that it's actually drawn from the Bible, okay? It's drawn from the Bible, Luke chapter 12. Open your Bible to Luke chapter 12, okay? From verse 35 to 48, okay? Luke chapter 12. Okay. Um, can somebody read for us? Esther, do you want to read? Twelve thirty-five. Yeah. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. Thirty-six. Yeah, read on, read on. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master, when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may be open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them to sit down to eat and will come and serve them. 38. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Then Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us or to all people? 42, and the Lord said, who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household? to give them their portion of food in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find doing when he comes. 
Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk. 46. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed these deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. Amen. Does that apply to parenting? Pardon? Right. Praise God. This is why it is important for you to know what it is that is the assignment. What is required of me. Because he who gave us those children will one day come back and make, and we'll have to give an accounting for it. To whom much is given, much is required. And I said, he who knew what the master's will was, you can't start a task that you don't know what the requirements of it are. You know, and if you don't know, the Bible says, oh, ignorance is not an excuse. It says you'll be beaten, but with few blows. But I don't know how many few is. <laughs> You know, so we must make sure that we know what is required of us. We know the time frames. You understand, because a master can show up any day. Hallelujah. Are we together? Okay. So just bearing that in mind, okay, if we think of our children, you know, think of those children and ask yourself, am I clear what my responsibility as a parent is? to this child you know if i am clear what policies and what policies and guidelines are informing and governing my looking after this what my task in every workplace you have policies and guidelines isn't it right and procedures that inform your actions your manual your operational manual where do you get the guideline for what you're doing. So, so say, why are you doing this? You say, oh, because according to this section, this of our policy and procedures, this is what we're required to do. Okay? Where do you, what's the source of what you're using to raise your children with? Is this making sense? Oh, well, my grandmother said, hello, is it before your grandmother you will stand? Pardon? No, you wouldn't. Um, oh, he's not even your pastor, you know. It's, this is very important, you know. It is the one who gave that we will have an, that we will have to give an account to, amen. So if God gives you a, an assignment or gives you a blessing, then He also has a manual that informs that. How often do you search the Bible to find out what you're supposed to do? And what direction you're supposed to take with regards to things. You know. Then we have to ask ourselves also. What are the specific things that are required of me? The breakdown of these things. You know. Some of us were raised in an environment where. What parents were doing. They did as if they were doing you a favor. You know, is a favor we're doing you by looking after you, by doing this and so on. The truth is this, I want to debunk that. What parents do for their children is not a favor, it is their responsibility, their duty. Just as it is yours. So if you have been raised in a home that you were given the impression that your parents were doing you a favor by sending you to a good school, it was not a favor, they were simply doing their duty. Is this making sense? Yeah? Okay? Because if they didn't do their very best, you know, I was within their means, God will hold them accountable for it. And I don't know why, to, I don't know whether to say this, but a lot of us, including myself, I grew up in an environment where 
it was almost as if look at the favor we're doing you by putting food on the table giving you this and all that kind of stuff and i don't know whether it's uh, african or black parents that tend to do that a lot i don't know but a lot of us grew up with that and there's a danger that you end up doing the same thing with your own children and give them the impression that you're doing them a favor but no it's not a favor i am simply doing my duty before god it is my responsibility amen if it's somebody else's child okay you're doing a favor but if it's the one that is yours then it is your duty. So, children will say to you, don't do it now. God will deal with you. <laughs> so when children understand this thing, then they now understand that, you know what, you're not doing any favor. You're doing what you must do before God. Don't do it now. I know his listeners, okay? <laughs> because I won't tell him that I'm doing him a favor anyway, in Jesus' name. I'm doing my very best, my responsibility. And then it's important for you to know what are your resources. Yeah? What are your resor What are the tools? What are the resources that you're using? How many books do you buy to guide you in terms of your good Christian books, in terms of to help you with your parenting? What materials are you listening to? What teaching resources are there? Who are the people you surround yourself with to speak into your life, to help you, to pray with you? Do you have a prayer partner for your children? Do you have another family who you're connected with, who you gather together at various times to just pray and trust God concerning the destiny of your children? Do you have dedicated fasting times to just trust God? Do you have materials where do you spend time to learn how to prophesy over their lives and so on? You know, every job comes with tools and resources, isn't it? What are your tools and resources for carrying out this great and incredible task that God has placed before you? Is this making sense to somebody here? Yeah? Today is a tool. Today is a resource. You know, shall I tell you what is interesting? People who usually need this thing the most are the people who access it the what? The least. Usually. And what is interesting is this. Do you know, your children will always reveal what you did or didn't do. That's the truth. They will always reveal. Your children will always demonstrate or manifest in public what you fail to do in private. Always. You know? Hallelujah. Okay. All right. So, let's, let's try somebody else. What did they say? Esther, you've done well. You've spoken. Auntie Daisy, one, one more. And um, Sister Victoria said that for her, the area where she feels um, she needs to focus on more is the, the fourth column. Um, so it was about the process and procedure, the way, knowing the, the how of, of parenting. And particularly as um, her children grow and they reach different stages, recognizing that every child is unique. So how to tailor the way and the how to meet the specific needs of each of her children at the specific stages that they're in and doing that um, in a timely manner so that it's having the impact required and she's not doing it um, when it's too late or doing it beforehand. So for her, it, it was primarily the, the, the way, the how, and ensuring that that is done at the appropriate time. Yeah, I think um, um, Sister Daisy also um, said the same thing as myself. I think the way, the process and the procedures were the same um, point that she uh, mentioned about um, raising up, or you know, um, raising up kids. Um, she said that um, I think um, knowing how to do it, the way in which you know she would do it, matters because that would determine how 
well, you know, she gets it, you know. So um, I think that was, I think both of us said almost the same thing. We agreed on that point. Yeah. Um, do, you know, do you know something I found interesting? Okay, hear this, very interesting. When we realized that we were going to be doing, okay, um, I, as much as I studied social work and everything, when we realized that we wanted to run a service on early years and you know child care and those things, okay, we had to go back to uni to go and study. We had to go and buy books, buy material, attend lectures, all those things, yeah, in order to be able to watch this look after, care for, raise other people's children. Are, are you with me? Yeah? Because as far as the government is concerned, you needed to do that, to the point of even doing it at postgraduate level. Are you with me? If you see all the books, uh, I mean, I, I have more books. If, if any book, maybe the closest number of books I have close to Bibles, is my books on child development, child care and everything, to look after other people's children. But shall I tell you what is interesting about this? The person who actually has the children did not buy a single book. Isn't that a contradiction? The people who have the children don't buy a single book. And the person who is just wanting to look after somebody else's child goes to buy all those books, goes to take all the courses and everything. Now, who should the child be more valuable to? The person who is doing it for pay or the person who it came out of their body and is for life? Of course, the parents. You know, I'm saying this because if you truly value the seed or the fruit that came out of your life, you will, go, you will do everything possible to make sure that not a day, not a second, not a hair is lost on that child. The person who owns should invest more than the person who is just doing it for business. Is it making sense? Yeah. Because, you see, for us, I was just, let me put it this way. It's a job. Okay? Your children are beyond a job. They are your life. So if anybody should make a greater investment, it should be you, not the person who it is a job for. What are you thinking? Pardon? Sometimes it's good, to, it's good to know. Because if you don't get the information, you may not know. Because every parent, as far as I, I know, they, try, they are doing their own best in their own way to bring up their children. But sometimes we don't know exactly how to do it. The information we need the time that we need. So it's, it's so difficult. So those who are, are called or employed to look after those children, because you know you are going in for a job, definitely you will be trained yourself because if you don't train yourself, you will not be given the job. So you seem to have more information than the parents. Yeah. But you know, but, you know what I'm trying to bring up is the contradiction of it. For well, the person who is just a job, a nine-to-five, and is just a job, is putting in more investment, and the person who it is their own life. I don't know if that makes sense. You know? Because it is the person who it is, it is if, if these children are yours for, for life, they are your life, they're everything. So the more reason why the person who gave back to the child should be the person who should invest more than the person who it is just a job. Am I making sense? 
I'm trying to turn around something to change something, which means, you know what? Search out, acquire every tool, everything that is required. For some of us, for our professions, whether it's, it's, it's IT, whether it's whatever it is, we, we, we get everything we need to be able to make sure that we do that job well. You know? But your children are more than a job. They're more precious than any job. You can drop a job and go and do something else tomorrow. Can you just drop the children and go and pick up another one somewhere? No. Hallelujah. Putting him more as it were than the biological parents. I think the issue, one of the issues is that there is no legal, in quote, responsibility or expectation from the biological parents. Let me explain. Because the people in nursing or medicine or even pilots, there is a requirement that if you don't retrain yourself, after a particular time, you will lose your license. Am I making sense? So that keeps those people in that field on their toes. Earlier on, we started that parenting is a gift. It is not something forced on you. You can choose not to have children. But immediately, you decide to have children. There is a responsibility. Am I right? But obviously, if you look at it very well, I think that responsibility is not like mandatory, like the illustration of MOT when you choose to drive road tax. There is no option with your insurance of the car. So we find out that we grow up as parents having taken secular profession more serious than our parenting responsibility. Mm. We put more, sad to say, people in the child care field study more for the child they are looking after at work, not necessarily their own children. Mm. Because I want to be in job. I need money. This is the framework in which I must work. There is an unwritten law, unwritten response, uh, 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 unwritten expectation for we that are biological parents. But we don't take it serious. Oh, this one, this policy is outside. But when I get home, it's a different one. So how can we both the church and even the government begin to train up. You made mention earlier on some of us were in A and E trying to address the evil that has already been done. But there are, there are generations that they have not even stepped in. How can we imbibe? How can we train how can we put in their heart that hold on, you have a choice to choose to be a parent. But please, when you become a parent, these are the things you must. Otherwise, the challenge outside where we are having children as parents, we are having what? Children. As parents. So, where are we talking about job description? I, my group here is very interesting. Uh, Tammy is my partner in my group. So, the first thing is this. For me to 
make him to talk because he doesn't want to talk. Say, I'm not a parent. Will you be a parent? He says, some time later. Okay, let's fast forward the time closer. And I discovered that I had to go into the dictionary to define what job description, what description is. And the answers this man was giving me, I said, okay. In terms of resources and other stuff. So we have to look at where is our priority? What is the scale for parenting responsibility for me? What is the scale? How important it is. You know, in marriage, there are things when you want to get married, they will cancel. We tell people, you need to have three tables. One is the negotiable, one is the non-negotiable, and one is the one that I don't really bother. Now, in my life, in my task, in my assignment, is parenting responsibility, is it something that I can relegate to middle, to the bottom? If there's nobody assessing me, do I know that I'm going to give back to feedback? Psalm 127 verse 3 says, children are gifts from the Lord. And it's not a gift that you can do anything you want for. You see, one of the things that makes us to be straight, especially me, when I'm driving, that I keep looking at my speed, is because I know the cost of getting under driving license. There is no, we do anything anyhow as parents because there is no repercussion. Is there? Well, there is. But... No, I'm saying in terms of in future, do we really put in perspective that we give an account? Otherwise, if that is clear in our phone, we'll invest more. We'll invest more. We'll put in our best. And there's a cascading effect on that. By the time we put in our best and we get more resources to be educated, we discover that we have not only done it for ourselves, we have done it for the children, which will in turn transmit and translate. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. So there is a whole lot there whereby we have misplaced priority. That's the first thing. Number two, uh, we don't even see it as a privilege. Number three, there is nothing like I'm going to give account. We've lost that. Not only outside, even inside. Am I living, am I looking after the children like, hold on, they're going to score me? And this scoring is not just, oh, your children, they are educated. Oh, you know, the book on duties of... Uh, uh, parents, 17 things that the um, Jesse John John Ryle uh, talked about: the way of the Lord, studying of the Bible, uh, uh, overindulging, uh, the issue about sin. Lot of things there that if we are to greet ourselves as parents, all over 17, I ask myself, how many will I get? So we find out that people, we are putting more effort. Because when the question came, the question is that we are putting in more effort on material things because we want to survive. I asked a young man, um, let, let me read out what, what the question is. I said, resources required. He said, get job. He said, money. And partner. That is the resources required to be a good parent. I, I said, time frame. He told me, he said, the time frame is throughout your life. As a parent, you must be a parent, which is good. Parenting for life. So we need to now change our priority and start looking at it from another perspective of, you know what? It's good for me to be on top of my professional game. But am I on top for this generation? Go with Apples in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Praise God. Um, somebody wants to say something? Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. Um, I, I think that this is something that is, you know, um, very, very, because very crucial because the value you place on something is revealed in the amount of 
energy, time, resources, you're prepared to commit towards it. You know, the, the, the more important a, a task is, the more careful you are to make sure you have all the tools and all the resources you need to make sure you don't fail with it. You know, and I think as, you know, Angleke was saying, is that because we don't see immediate, we're not immediately held accountable. To some extent, social services may do so, family members may do so, but the truth of the matter is that every day, the result of what you did or didn't do will be showing in the life of the children. That's the truth. It will be showing. And guess what? Every day you'll be paying the price of what you didn't do the last season. Does that make sense? Because the, 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 the harvest of last season will always be manifesting. So last year you didn't do some things. You know, this year you begin to experience it. You know, and this year, if you don't do some things, by next year, you'll be harvesting it again. So, to some extent, you'll be getting the results. Pay as you go. <laughs> you know, pay as you go. But there's some things that it is much, much later, you know, later in life, that you will see, oh my God, you know, is that... That means that that thing, and that's why the Bible teaches something. That if you want to go to your bed and rest and sleep well, put in what you need to do now. Yeah, so that when it is time, you know, your old age, in all honesty, is when you should be retiring, resting, relaxing, peace. Amen. But if you didn't do what you were supposed to do before, you will discover that as you're older, your heart will be beating every day. Oh God, oh God. Oh God, oh God, oh God, these children, they won't kill me. Hey, every time when the phone rings, hey, what? <laughs> it's true. Absolutely true. Okay. Yes, my dear. So I was just saying, in line with what you've just said about being held to account and ensuring that um, what we're seeing in our children on a daily basis aligns with what we're trying to achieve if we should have a column on success measure outcome both immediate and and long term so that we're self-evaluating because we've all said no one is holding us to account but in a way that puts more responsibility on us because there isn't an external factor there isn't an external person saying well how is this child doing so we should have something that we can then use to self-evaluate on a short and a long-term basis so that we can realign if we're not on track very good it's a very good question okay hallelujah Okay, hear this, yeah? <clears throat> um, there, there was this, I was, I teach this, I use it to teach, you know, and I'll bring it back to this point, okay? Which is um, the story of the man, the axe, the tree, and the master, okay? Four, the man, the axe, the tree, and the master, okay? For every seed, let me ask a question. Before you planted, did you know what you should be harvesting? Okay. Which means that the outcome, the desired outcome, right, should already be clear before you even started planting. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that how can you tell, oh, Jesus Christ went to a tree. And when he got there, he didn't see what he was looking for, which means that according to Luke chapter 13, the Bible says that the owner of the vineyard went there and he says, ah, for three years you have been here. And he's not producing the fruit that is intended. Yeah? He said, cut it down. He says, because it is 
depleting the soil, it is intercepting the sun, wasting space, you know, occupying on some ground that we could have used for other things. They cut it down. The other guy said, please, that is Jesus Christ interceding, saying, please, give it one more year. Let me do a few things. If it doesn't produce the expected fruit, then we can cut it down. Which means that even when you, before you start, you already know what are the expected outcomes of success. Does that make sense? You should know your success criteria before you start. Otherwise, you know, you cannot, that's why the Bible says that you cannot discuss sin where there is no law. You cannot, before you set an exam, you already know what the, what pass mark should be, what success should be. Does that make sense? Because you cannot determine failure where there has been no success mark. Is this making sense? Okay. All right. So, we must all be clear, okay, what does it mean that when I have succeeded as a parent, okay, what, what are the outcomes? Because outcomes are very crucial, okay? For, for us as believers, okay, the Bible is very clear about what, when you have been successful in your outcome, okay? Now, let's just do this very quickly. What are the Things that the Bible shows us are evidence that you have been successful. What are they? Examples. Number one is what? That the children are what? Okay, well, we define godly. Define the word godly. Okay, somebody says, number one, they have a fear of the Lord. Okay, let, let me actually... Um, can I can I have this, baby? Can you open to okay um, your if you have Kindle, okay. If you have a Kindle, there's a book that is worthwhile, okay, for you to, to have, okay? Let me just, it's called Tori's New Topical Textbook, okay? Tori's New Topical Textbook. Okay. And it says children, okay, under children, which you would find, okay. Um, number one, it says that Jesus Christ was an example of a good child. So if you want to look at what your success criteria are, okay, Christ formed in them. My little children, unto whom I labor, unto weariness, until Christ is formed in them. What scripture is that? Luke chapter 4 and verse 19. Luke 4, 19. Okay. Luke 4, 19. What am I saying? Galatians 4, 19. Galatians 4.19. I'm, I'm busy. Sorry. Galatians 4.19. Okay. What does it say? My what? Little children for whom I labor in birth again until what? Christ is formed in you. In the Amplified Bible, how does it put it? Okay. Amplified. My little children for whom I am again suffering birth pangs until Christ is completely and permanently formed and molded in you. Number one success criteria of good parenting is Christ formed in those children. That Christ becomes embedded in their heart. Okay? That is that 
Christ Jesus is formed, found and formed in them. That's the number one criteria of success. Once Christ is found and formed on the inside of them, you have achieved your first mark. In fact, that mark is the number one mark that carries the most weight. You know, in many exams that you take, they say the question number one carries 25 points. Then every other question carries maybe five, five points. Okay? That one is the one that carries the highest point. Hallelujah. Because it is the basis of all other things. Okay? And what does it mean that Christ is formed in them? It means that they are obedient children. They obey God and their parents. Number two, it means that they fear God. And reverence their parents. They should be children who remember and put God first in all things. Okay. It's if you can is on your screen. You can enlarge. Okay, that's fine. So what do you see? What's what's there? Okay. Obey God, okay? Fear God, remember God, attend to parental teaching. They honor their children who honor their parents. They obey their parents. They take care of their parents in their old age, okay? They what? Honor the aged. It says they do not imitate bad parents. Okay, is is that is that how you have it? Is that the Tory? It's all to some extent. Okay, um, over here. Are we together? Without going into. It goes on to say that they're children who know and observe the law of God. Okay? It says that they show love to their parents. They set to make their parents' hearts glad. Okay? They honor the ages and so on. So the Bible gives examples of, of those children. Christ Jesus, number one, speaks of Isaac, of Joseph, Jephthah's daughter, Samson to some extent, Samuel, Obadiah, Josiah, Esther, and so on. Okay? Can I just bring back to the point of this is why you need a reference point, which is the word of God, to determine what you will be able to say Based on this, we have succeeded. Are we together? Are we together? Yeah? So that your reference point for success cannot be Brother Johnson's children. Because they got first class at, in their degree at university. Am I making sense? Yeah? Because that is a worldly criteria. Thank God we want all our children to get first class. But if they have first class, but they do not fear God, they don't know God, they have no reverence for their parents, okay? They're children who curse and swear and are like the sons of Belial, but just because they got first class, uh -huh, they're good children. That is contrary to the Bible. Because the standards of the Bible are not the same as that of the world. Are we making sense here? Yes. Okay. All right.
And it's important for you to begin to ask yourself, what is it that defines and what is the big, what is, well, remember I asked the question about the policies and procedures that are governing your raising your children. Because for you to know whether you have done a good job, are we together? In your workplace, how do you know whether you've done the right thing? Pardon? Well, is there your in your policies and procedures in your workplace? Yeah. Once you have followed policy, okay. Says well. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Once you have followed policy and procedure, and you have done everything that your policy and procedures have required of you, do you know you've done a good job? So that success should not be a mystery. It's almost like taking an exam, you don't know what the pass mark is, or you don't know what it, it is to have passed or failed. The Bible teaches something very clear. God makes his will very clear so that all men may know where they stand with him. Are we together? Okay. Really, really important. Okay. Can I ask very quickly? Okay. Please take notes where you can. Okay. Could you play that, Pastor Nicole? Yeah. I want you to just listen to this. Start with chapter one, please. Please listen attentively. Okay. This is taken from duties of parents. Okay. All right. And it is vital that, let me just encourage everyone. Okay. As parents, not only have we gotten the book, but we have also encouraged our children to listen to it. Okay. Let me tell you what we did. After listening to it, okay, and getting Joshua to listen to it, then we said to him, I said to him, have a look at this. Now you know what your parents' responsibilities are to you. Are you, are you with me? Are we together? Yeah? One house. One house. Okay. All right, mommy, wait, wait, what's that? I know you're trying to catch up, but just listen. I said to him, did you hear, are you, are you clear? We've listened to you over and over again. Now, based on this, I want you to evaluate whether your parents are doing the right thing when they talk to you, when they do this or when they do that. Then, do you know what, Susan, interesting enough, the more he has listened to it, the more grateful he has become to us. To say, oh, I thank God for my parents. I thank God because he, he's beginning to realize that these parents didn't drop from the moon. And they're not just doing their own thing. They're following a code. Does that make sense? Yeah? Because from him listening to that, the Bible says, by the testimony of two or three witnesses shall a matter be established. So when daddy is doing like this, he's not being wicked. He's actually doing what is the is, is a godly thing and what the Bible is teaching to do. Is this making sense? Yeah. So because of that, it becomes easier for them to cooperate with you in what is being done because they are realizing now that actually this is not just him. You know what? He is being also obedient to a principle. And why is that important? You see, when Isaac knew that Abraham was following a divine direction what did he do he submitted to his father okay media are we ready proverbs 22 verse 6 praise god Um, okay. The text at the head of this page. The sound of it is probably familiar to your ears, like an old tune. It is likely you. 
Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22, verse 6. I suppose that most professing Christians are acquainted with the text at the head of this page. The sound of it is probably familiar to your ears, like an old tune. It is likely you have heard it, or read it, talked of it, or quoted it many a time. Is it not so? But, after all, how little is the substance of this text regarded? The doctrine it contains appears scarcely known. The duty it puts before us seems fearfully seldom practiced. Reader, do I not speak the truth? It cannot be said that the subject is a new one. The world is old, and we have the experience of nearly 6,000 years to help us. We live in days when there is a mighty zeal for education in every quarter. We hear of new schools rising on all sides. We are told of new systems and new books for the young of every sort and description. And still for all this, the vast majority of children are manifestly not trained in the way they should go. For when they grow up to man's estate, they do not walk with God. Now, how shall we account for this state of things? The plain truth is, the Lord's commandment in our text is not regarded, and therefore the Lord's promise in our text is not fulfilled. Reader, these things may well give rise to great searchings of heart. Suffer then a word of exhortation from a minister about the right training of children. Believe me, the subject is one that should come home to every conscience and make every one ask himself the question, Am I, in this matter, doing what I can? It is a subject that concerns almost all. There is hardly a household that it does not touch. Parents, nurses, teachers, godfathers, godmothers, uncles, aunts, brothers, sisters, all have an interest in it. Few can be found, I think, who might not influence some parent in the management of his family or affect the training of some child by suggestion or advice. All of us, I suspect, can do something here, either directly or indirectly, and I wish to stir up all to bear this in remembrance. It is a subject, too, on which all concerned are in great danger of coming short of their duty. This is preeminently a point in which men can see the faults of their neighbors more clearly than their own. They will often bring up their children in the very path which they have denounced to their friends as unsafe. They will see motes in other men's families and overlook beams in their own. They will be quick-sighted as eagles in detecting mistakes abroad and yet blind as bats to fatal errors which are daily going on at home. They will be wise about their brother's house but foolish about their own flesh and blood. Here, if anywhere, we have need to suspect our own judgment. This, too, you will do well to bear in mind. Come now and let me place before you a few hints about right training. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, bless them and make them words in season to you all. Reject them not because they are blunt and simple. Despise them not because they contain nothing new. Be very sure, if you would train children for heaven, they are hints that ought not to be lightly set aside. Chapter 1. Train Your Child Rightly First, then, if you would train your children rightly, train them in the way they should go, and not in the way that they would. Remember, children are born with a decided bias towards evil, and therefore, if you let them choose for themselves, they are certain to choose wrong. The mother cannot tell what her tender infant may grow up to be. Tall or short, weak or strong, wise or foolish, he may be any of these or not. It is all uncertain. But one thing that the mother can say with certainty he will have a corrupt and sinful heart. It is natural to us to do wrong. Foolishness, says Solomon, 
is bound in the heart of a child. Proverbs 22, verse 15. A child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Proverbs 29, verse 15. Our hearts are like the earth on which we tread. Let it alone, and it is sure to bear weeds. If then you would deal wisely with your child, you must not leave him to the guidance of his own will. Think for him, judge for him, act for him, just as you would for one weak and blind. But for pity's sake, give him not up to his own wayward tastes and inclinations. It must not be his likings and wishes that are consulted. He knows not yet what is good for his mind and soul any more than what is good for his body. You do not let him decide what he shall eat and what he shall drink and how he shall be clothed. Be consistent and deal with his mind in like manner. Train him in the way that is scriptural and right and not in the way that he fancies. If you cannot make up your mind to this first principle of Christian training, it is useless for you to read any further. Self-will is almost the first thing that appears in a child's mind, and it must be your first step to resist it. Chapter 2 Tenderness, Affection, and Patience Train up your child with all tenderness, affection, and patience. I do not mean that you are to spoil him, but I do mean that you should let him see that you love him. Love should be the silver thread that runs through all your conduct. Kindness, gentleness, long-suffering, forbearance, patience, sympathy, a willingness to enter into childish troubles, a readiness to take part in childish joys, These are the cords by which a child may be led most easily. These are the clues you must follow if you would find the way to his heart. Few are to be found even among grown-up people who are not more easy to draw than to drive. There is that in all our minds which rises in arms against compulsion. We set up our backs and stiffen our necks at the very idea of a forced obedience. We are like young horses in the hand of a breaker. Handle them kindly and make much of them, and by and by you may guide them with thread. Use them roughly and violently, and it will be many a month before you get the mastery of them at all. Now, children's minds are cast in much the same mold as our own. Sternness and severity of manner chill them and throw them back. It shuts up their hearts, and you will weary yourself to find the door. But let them only see that you have an affectionate feeling towards them, that you are really desirous to make them happy and to do them good, that if you punish them it is intended for their profit, and that, like the pelican, you would give your heart's blood to nourish their souls. Let them see this, I say, and they will soon be all your own but they must be wooed with kindness if their attention is ever to be won. And surely reason itself might teach us this lesson. Children are weak and tender creatures, and as such they need patient and considerate treatment. We must handle them delicately like frail machines, lest by rough fingering we do more harm than good. They are like young plants and need gentle watering, often but little at a time. We must not expect all things at once. We must remember what children are and teach them as they are able to bear. Their minds are like a lump of metal, not to be forged and made useful at once, but only by a succession of little blows. Their understandings are like narrow-necked vessels. We must pour in the wine of knowledge gradually, or much of it will be spilled and lost. Line upon line and precept upon precept Here a little and there a little must be our rule. The whetstone does its work slowly, but frequent rubbing will bring the sieve to a fine edge. Truly, there is need of patience in training a child, but without it, nothing can be done. Nothing will compensate for the absence of this tenderness and love. A minister may speak the truth as it is in Jesus, 
clearly, forcibly, unanswerably. But if he does not speak it in love, few souls will be won. Just so you must set before your children their duty. Command, threaten, punish, reason. But if affection be wanting in your treatment, your labor will be all in vain. Love is one grand secret of successful training. Anger and harshness may frighten, but they will not persuade the child that you are right. And if he sees you often out of temper, you will soon cease to have his respect. A father who speaks to his son as Saul did to Jonathan, in 1 Samuel 20, verse 30, need not expect to retain his influence over that son's mind. Try hard to keep up a hold on your children's affections. It is a dangerous thing to make your children afraid of you. Anything is almost better than reserve and constraint between your child and yourself, and this will come in with fear. Fear puts an end to openness of manner. Fear leads to concealment. Fear sows the seed of much hypocrisy and leads to many a lie. There is a mine of truth in the Apostle's words to the Colossians. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Colossians 3, verse 21. Let not the advice it contains be overlooked. Chapter 3. Much depends on you. Train your children with an abiding persuasion on your mind that much depends upon you. Grace is the strongest of all principles. See what a revolution grace effects when it comes into the heart of an old sinner. How it overturns the strongholds of Satan. How it casts down mountains, fills up valleys, makes crooked things straight, and new creates the whole man. Truly nothing is impossible to grace. Nature, too, is very strong. See how it struggles against the things of the kingdom of God, how it fights against every attempt to be more holy, how it keeps up an unceasing warfare within us to the last hour of life. Nature, indeed, is strong. But after nature and grace... Undoubtedly, there is nothing more powerful than education. Early habits, if I may so speak, are everything with us under God. We are made what we are by training. Our character takes the form of that mold into which our first years are cast. We depend in a vast measure on those who bring us up. We get from them a color, a taste, a bias which clings to us more or less all our lives. We catch the language of our nurses and mothers and learn to speak it almost insensibly and unquestionably we catch something of their manners, ways, and mind at the same time. Time only will show, I suspect, how much we all owe to early impressions and how many things in us may be traced up to seed sown in the days of our very infancy by those who were about us. A very learned Englishman, Mr. Locke, has gone so far as to say that all of the men we meet with, nine parts out of ten, are what they are, good or bad, useful or not, according to their education. And all this is one of God's merciful arrangements. He gives your children a mind that will receive impressions like moist clay. He gives them a disposition at the starting point of life to believe what you tell them and to take for granted what you advise them, and to trust your word rather than a stranger's. He gives you, in short, a golden opportunity of doing them good. See that the opportunity be not neglected and thrown away. Once let it slip, it is gone forever. Beware of that miserable delusion into which some have fallen, that parents can do nothing for their children, that you must leave them alone, wait for grace, and sit still. These persons have wishes for their children in Balaam's fashion. They would like them to die the death of the righteous man, but they do nothing to make them live his life. They desire much and have nothing, and the devil rejoices to see such reasoning, just as he always does over anything which seems to excuse indolence or to encourage neglect of means. 
I know that you cannot convert your child. I know well that they who are born again are born not of the will of man, but of God. But I know also that God says expressly, Train up a child in the way he should go, and that he never laid a command on man which he would not give man grace to perform. And I know too that our duty is not to stand still and dispute, but to go forward and obey. It is just in the going forward that God will meet us. The path of obedience is the way in which he gives the blessing. We have only to do as the servants were commanded at the marriage feast in Cana, to fill the water pots with water, and we may safely leave it to the Lord to turn that water into wine. Chapter 4 Consider the Soul of Your Child Train with this thought continually before your eyes, that the soul of your child is the first thing to be considered. Precious, no doubt, are these little ones in your eyes, but if you love them, think often of their souls. No interest should weigh with you so much as their eternal interests. No part of them should be so dear to you as that part which will never die. The world with all its glory shall pass away. The hills shall melt. The heavens shall be wrapped together as a scroll. The sun shall cease to shine. But the spirit which dwells in those little creatures whom you love so well shall outlive them all. And whether in happiness or misery, to speak as a man, will depend on you. This is the thought that should be uppermost on your mind in all you do for your children. In every step you take about them, in every plan and scheme and arrangement that concerns them, do not leave out that mighty question, how will this affect their souls? Soul love is the soul of all love. To pet and pamper and indulge your child as if this world was all he had to look to, and this life the only season for happiness? To do this is not true love, but cruelty. It is treating him like some beast of the earth, which has but one world to look to, and nothing after death. It is hiding from him that grand truth, which he ought to be made to learn from his very infancy, that the chief end of his life is the salvation of his soul. A true Christian must be no slave to fashion, if he would train his child for heaven. He must not be content to do things merely because they are the custom of the world, to teach them and instruct them in certain ways merely because it is usual, to allow them to read books of a questionable sort merely because everybody else reads them, to let them form habits of a doubtful tendency merely because they are the habits of the day. He must train with an eye to his children's souls he must not be ashamed to hear his training called Singar and strange. What if it is? The time is short. The fashion of this world passeth away. He that has trained his children for heaven rather than for earth, for God rather than for man, he is the parent that will be called wise at last. Chapter 5 a knowledge of the Bible. Train your child to a knowledge of the Bible. You cannot make your children love the Bible, I allow. None but the Holy Ghost can give us a heart to delight in the Word. But you can make your children acquainted with the Bible, and be sure they cannot be acquainted with that blessed book too soon or too well. A thorough knowledge of the Bible is the foundation of all clear views of religion. He that is well grounded in it will not generally be found a waverer and carried about by every wind of new doctrine. Any system of training which does not make a knowledge of Scripture the first thing is unsafe and unsound. You have need to be careful on this point just now. For the devil is abroad and error abounds. Some are to be found amongst us who give the church the honor due to Jesus Christ. Some are to be found who make the sacraments, saviors, and passports to eternal life. And some are to be found in like manner 
who honor a catechism more than the Bible, or fill the minds of their children with miserable little storybooks instead of the scripture of truth. But if you love your children, let the simple Bible be everything in the training of their souls, and let all other books go down and take the second place. Care not so much for their being mighty in the catechism as for their being mighty in the scriptures. This is the training, believe me, that God will honor. The psalmist says of him, Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Psalm 138, verse 2. And I think that he gives an especial blessing to all who try to magnify it among men. See that your children read the Bible reverently. Train them to look on it not as the word of men, but as it is, in truth, the word of God, written by the Holy Ghost himself. All true, all profitable, and able to make us wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. See that they read it regularly. Train them to regard it as their soul's daily food, as a thing essential to their soul's daily health. I know well you cannot make this anything more than a form, but there is no telling the amount of sin which a mere form may indirectly restrain. See that they read it all. You need not shrink from bringing any doctrine before them. You need not fancy that the leading doctrines of Christianity are things which children cannot understand. Children understand far more of the Bible than we are apt to suppose. Tell them of sin, its guilt, its consequences, its power, and its vileness. You will find they can comprehend something of this. Tell them of the Lord Jesus Christ and his work for our salvation, the atonement, the cross, the blood, the sacrifice, the intercession. You will discover there is something not beyond them in all this. Tell them of the work of the Holy Spirit in man's heart, how he changes and renews and sanctifies and purifies. You will soon see they can go along with you in some measure in this. In short, I suspect we have no idea how much a little child can take in of the length and breadth of the glorious gospel. They see far more of these things than we suppose. Fill their minds with scripture. Let the word dwell in them richly. Give them the Bible, the whole Bible, even while they are young. Chapter 6 A Habit of Prayer Train them to a habit of prayer. Prayer is the very life breath of true religion. It is one of the first evidences that a man is born again. Behold, said the Lord of Saul, in the day he sent Ananias to him, Behold, he prayeth. Acts 9, verse 11. He had begun to pray, and that was proof enough. Prayer was the distinguishing mark of the Lord's people in the day that there began to be a separation between them and the world. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Genesis 4, verse 26. Prayer is the peculiarity of all real Christians now. They pray, for they tell God their wants, their feelings, their desires, their fears, and mean what they say. The nominal Christian may repeat prayers, and good prayers too, but he goes no further. Prayer is the turning point in a man's soul. Our ministry is unprofitable, and our labor is vain till you are brought to your knees. Till then, we have no hope about you. Prayer is one great secret of spiritual prosperity. When there is much private communion with God, your soul will grow like the grass after rain. When there is little, all will be at a standstill. You will barely keep your soul alive. Show me a growing Christian, a going forward Christian, a strong Christian, a flourishing Christian, and sure am I, he is one that speaks often with his Lord. He asks much, and he has much. He tells Jesus everything, and so he always knows how to act. Prayer is the mightiest engine God has placed in our hands. 
It is the best weapon to use in every difficulty and the surest remedy in every trouble. It is the key that unlocks the treasury of promises and the hand that draws forth grace and help in time of need. It is the silver trumpet God commands us to sound in all our necessity, and it is the cry He has promised always to attend to, even as a loving mother to the voice of her child. Prayer is the simplest means that man can use in coming to God. It is within reach of all, the sick, the aged, the infirm, the paralytic, the blind, the poor, the unlearned, all can pray. It avails you nothing to plead want of memory and want of learning and want of books and want of scholarship in this matter. So long as you have a tongue to tell your soul's state, you may and ought to pray. Those words, ye have not because ye ask not, James 4 verse 2, will be a fearful condemnation to many in the day of judgment. Parents, if you love your children, do all that lies in your power to train them up to a habit of prayer. Show them how to begin. Tell them what to say. Encourage them to persevere. Remind them if they become careless and slack about it. Let it not be your fault at any rate if they never call on the name of the Lord. This, remember, is the first step in religion which a child is able to take. Long before he can read, you can teach him to kneel by his mother's side and repeat the simple words of prayer and praise which she puts in his mouth. And as the first steps in an undertaking are always most important, so is the manner in which your children's prayers are prayed, a point which deserves your closest attention. Few seem to know how much depends on this. You must beware lest they get into a way of saying them in a hasty, careless, and irreverent manner. You must beware of giving up the oversight of this matter to servants and nurses or trusting too much to your children, doing it when left to themselves. I cannot praise that mother who never looks after this important part of her child's daily life herself. Surely, if there be any habit which your own hand and I should help in forming, it is the habit of prayer. Believe me, if you never hear your children pray yourself, you are much to blame. You are little wiser than the bird described in Job, which leaveth her eggs in the earth, and warmeth them in the dust, and forgetteth that the foot may crush them, or that the wild beast may break them. She is hardened against her young ones as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without fear. Job 39 verses 14 through 16 Prayer is, of all habits, the one which we recollect the longest. Many a gray-headed man could tell you how his mother used to make him pray in the days of his childhood. Other things have passed away from his mind, perhaps. The church where he was taken to worship, the minister whom he heard preach, the companions who he used to play with. All these, it may be, have passed from his memory and left no mark behind. But you will often find it as but you will often find it is far different with his first prayers. He will often be able to tell you where he knelt and what he was taught to say and even how his mother looked all the while. It will come up as fresh before his mind's eye as if it was but yesterday. Reader, if you love your children, I charge you, do not let the seed time of a prayerful habit pass away unimproved. If you train your children to anything, Train them, at least, to a habit of prayer. <clears throat> um, there's one more I want you to listen to. One more, and then we'll stop. Yeah, But I really need you to pay serious attention to this last one. Okay, are we together? Okay, pay serious attention to this. All of them are important, but listen to this. Play, please. Chapter 7 Diligence in the Public Means of Grace Train them to habits of diligence and regularity about public means of grace. Tell them of the duty and privilege of going to the house of God 
and joining in the prayers of the congregation. Tell them that wherever the Lord's people are gathered together, there the Lord Jesus is present in a special manner, and that those who absent themselves must expect, like the Apostle Thomas, to miss a blessing. Tell them of the importance of hearing the word preached, and that it is God's ordinance for converting, sanctifying, and building up the souls of men. Tell them how the Apostle Paul enjoins us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, Hebrews 10 verse 25, but to exhort one another to stir one another up to it, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. I call it a sad sight in a church when nobody comes up to the Lord's table but the elderly people, and the young men and the young women all turn away, but I call it a sadder sight still when no children are to be seen in a church, excepting those who come to the Sunday school and are obliged to attend. Let none of this guilt lie at your doors. There are many boys and girls in every parish besides those who come to school, and you who are their parents and friends should see to it that they come with you to church. Do not allow them to grow up with a habit of making vain excuses for not coming. Give them plainly to understand that so long as they are under your roof, it is the rule of your house for everyone in health to honor the Lord's house upon the Lord's day, and that you reckon the Sabbath breaker to be a murderer of his own soul. See to it, too, if it can be so arranged, that your children go with you to church and sit near you when they are there. To go to church is one thing, but to behave well at church is quite another. And believe me, there is no security for good behavior like that of having them under your own eye. The minds of young people are easily drawn aside and their attention lost, and every possible means should be used to counteract this. I do not like to see them coming to church by themselves. They often get into bad company by the way, and so learn more evil on the Lord's Day than in all the rest of the week. Neither do I like to see what I call a young people's corner in a church. They often catch habits of inattention and irreverence there, which it takes years to unlearn, if ever they are unlearned at all. What I like to see is a whole family sitting together, old and young, side by side, men women and children serving God according to their households. But there are some who say that it is useless to urge children to attend means of grace because they cannot understand them. I would not have you listen to such reasoning. I find no such doctrine in the Old Testament. When Moses goes before Pharaoh in Exodus 10 verse 9, I observe he says, We will go with our young and with our old, with our sons and with our daughters, for we must hold a feast unto the Lord. When Joshua read the law in Joshua 8 verse 35, I observe, There was not a word which Joshua read, not before all the congregation of Israel, with the women and the little ones and the strangers that were conversant among them. Thrice in the year, says Exodus 34 verse 23, shall all your men children appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. And when I turn to the New Testament, I find children mentioned there as partaking in public acts of religion as well as in the Old. When Paul was leaving the disciples at Tyre for the last time, I find it said in Acts 21 verse 5, They all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city, and we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. Samuel, in the days of his childhood, appears to have ministered unto the Lord some time before he really knew him. Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. 1 Samuel 3, verse 7. The apostles themselves do not seem to have understood all that the Lord had said at the time that it was spoken. These things understood not his disciples at the first but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him. John 12, verse 16. Parents, comfort your minds with these examples. 
Be not cast down because your children see not the full value of the means of grace now. Only train them up to a habit of regular attendance. Set it before their minds as a high, holy, and solemn duty. And believe me, the day will very likely come when they will bless you for your deed. Praise God. Hallelujah. Okay, just very quickly, feedback. Anybody, quickly? You want to say something? Okay, feedback. Praise the Lord. Yeah, uh, I thank God for prayers and I thank God for uh, the advice pertaining the last one we just listened to. Uh, we, I see in the church, we, the parents, we've been coming to the church regularly. I can use myself as an uh, example. Uh, since I have my children or since I had them, I've been in the church from they want. Uh, maybe they have reached to the age of they want to come on their own. So my question or what I was thinking, what could you do when you've brought them this far and then they... They want to be coming on their own. For example, Larissa or Uchechi, they feel they have grown and they cannot sit along with you in the church. So what will you do? Because I, I can bet myself, I thank God that he gave me the wisdom, the knowledge, the power, the strength to bring them up exactly what the man was trying to tell us. But to a certain stage, you won't be able to force them or to, you know. So what do you do? Hallelujah. Just, just maybe. maybe it might be worthwhile to ask somebody who is doing it right now. Because this is your daughter, right? Praise God. Uh, praise the Lord. It's a very, very difficult thing, really. And in fact, in a, at a time, most of my children, they don't want to go to the same church with me. I said, as long as you are under my roof, this is the law. As long as you are eating my food, this <laughs> <laughs> you have no choice. But you are of age, as you said. You know, and uh, being of age, then you have to be on your own. Then I can pray along with you, but I can still advise you but the Bible said the uh, family that stay, uh, prays together stays together. But uh, it came to the point that I was seeing that most of them, they were in the church. They, physically, they, they were in the church, but they are not in the church. And I said, okay, we have to come to a conclusion. Look, uh, I want to know which church you go to. I want to know the pastor, I want to know the doctrine that is going on in that church. And uh, um, unfortunately, in this country, you can try your best, you know, to offer them the best, to train them. The thing is, uh, uh, pastor said it earlier on, uh, the uh, level of your success is how far you have obeyed the Lord. You know, it's not about, uh, you know, them not doing or doing, but it's you in per se, you know, what God, the duty that God asked you to perform, did you perform it? So once you perform that duty, and as he said, you know, uh, for them to come together is a good thing. But when they come to a, start, a certain age, all you need to do is pray along with them. And uh, most importantly, which I really thank God for in my home, or uh, the altar of prayer. I said, in the morning, before we leave the house, 6 a.m., everybody has to come down and we pray. And uh, we thank God that has, that has been going on. And, uh, you know, mommy is very, very difficult, but it's only with prayer and the grace of God it will be fulfilled. But, you know, at a certain age, you know, that uh, we have been told there also that, look, all this must be with love and persuasion. 
with love and persuasion. It's not about law. It's not about do you know, I was using carnality to say, oh, when well, you are when you are under my rule, and the salvation of their soul is more important. But the food, you know, I mean the food of uh, life they are eating is very, very important, very, very crucial. That's where I have pro I will have problem. If they are going to a church where it's all dance and uh, you know, without the Rima word of God. But when they are hearing the word of God, and I thank God, Debbie is here. You know, and uh, Daniel is in the LCC. So, but, you know, I've been to the two churches, and I know there's a sound doctrine there. And that's what is important. Praise God. Hallelujah. Um, thank you, sir. You know, um, just to bring up one important thing, can I just bring out a couple of secrets in this, okay? Um, when church is an attendance, it gets to a point where it does not promote cooperation. Okay? Service, purpose, service, and building is what always causes people to stay together. Remember in Genesis, the Bible says, come let us, what? Build. Come let us what? Build. Yeah? In the Bible, almost everywhere where families were shown to be working together, and we're talking about older children and their parents, it was where they were involved in building and serving, not attending. Is this making sense? Yeah? Please hear this because this is so important. Yeah? Almost everywhere, I cannot think of any other place, but almost everywhere where the Bible speaks about, serve, where, about parents with adult children working together, they were serving and building. Which means that if going to church is just an attendance, there will come a time when, why do we need to just attend with you? But when the house of God is a place of where we go to serve together and we're building together, it actually causes unity and cooperation because we're building something together. We're serving together. Yeah? Purpose is what always produces unity. Even enemies will come together when they have a common purpose. So that Herod and who? Pilate will even work together and be friends just to crucify Jesus. Am I making sense? Yeah? But once there is no purpose of serving, and even, even in marriages, marriages that last longer, okay? I usually marriages where there's an assignment that bonds them together. Once you remove purpose of assignment, okay, just like raising children many times keeps marriages together longer because there is an assignment to raise these children. And many people will say, if not for the children, I would have been out. But because we've made a commitment to raise these children together, they stay. And a lot of times what tends to happen is that when the children grow up and leave the home, you find that people then divorce and go their separate ways. Purpose always unites, not just attendance. Are we together? Yeah? This is an important truth that if you take hold of it, okay? And then above, then even next to that, okay, is the element of them finding, okay, God's calling. Do you understand this? Yeah? Calling. Discovering their calling in the house of God will keep them in that place. When they have not found their calling, then there will be no reason for them to remain in that place. 
Is this making sense? Yeah? Because calling and purpose is what roots, grounds, and holds people. If you're only just attending and there is no calling, there is no purpose, there is no ministry involved, it is easy to just uproot any time and just float away. You see? So if the young people or the children have quickly discovered their calling, what was it that kept Jesus in the church even when his parents were gone? What was it? The calling of his father's business. So that even if the parents should leave, the children say, we're staying because you know what? We have found our assignment. Even before the parents get to church, the children are already in church because they have found their calling, they have, they, they have entered into their father's business. Yes. The Debbie you see here today, when, he was, when she was with us over there, the service starts at uh, 10.30. She will be there 12 o'clock, sometime 12.30, and at the back, and before service ends, she's gone. So, but since she started here, I was flabbergasted. The eight o'clock, I mean, rushing out of the, sometimes, oh, do I have to bath now? No, I have to be in the church. And because he's a, she is excited to come in here, I know, like you said, it is true that, you know, she find her purpose, she find her calling, and that motivates her, really, which I thank God for, and I thank God for ICC. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. You see, this is a truth, yeah, that will, just to even bring that issue. You see this young lady uh, before? Ha. Ah. God have mercy. Now, is even mama that is late? Eh? And whether mama comes or doesn't come, you know what? She's in church, she's ready, she's even prayer meeting, she's even in seal team and everything. I said, God, you can do wonderful things, oh. There's hope for me too. <laughs> you know, so you see, this these two things that I've just shared with you, yeah. If they find let me tell you, when I want to punish Mr. Man, eh? I that is punishment. That means you will not go to choir rehearsal. Eh? We won't let you go and minister with the others. Quickly, the homework will be done. Quickly, alacrity, everything will just be done because I have to be with the rest of the team. When the punishment is that you will not go to join in the service, eh? so that he will come and hide and lie down over here, be hiding inside the church. To just, I say, no, you cannot go away from there. You know. So, and that's because purpose. An assignment has been discovered. You know, and, and the maintenance, he will say, Daddy, we, we have to go. Um, where, where are you ministering? You know, he wants to come with me to everywhere that I'm ministering. Because wherever we go, he knows what his own assignment will be in it. You know, and when children have an assignment and a ministry in the house of God, it always keeps them longer, huh? even for life in the things of God. You know, but if you have no assignment, you have no purpose, it's easy to just drift off and float around the place. Praise God. Okay, quickly, any other From what we heard, from what we heard, okay, quickly. I, I don't want to impose the mic on you, but I know that you've obviously heard a lot, okay. Thoughts? Otherwise, I'll give it to Ruru, because he has a lot to say. One thing you've learned, just one thing you've learned tonight. <laughs> what you say, you're not going to say. <laughs> 
Hallelujah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, pra- praise God. I just, just one thing. Yeah. Um, not for not word for word, but mm-hmm. based on what my understanding from what we read, that even though it may not, it may look like you're different. You know, people may say, you know, you you're different the way you. are Treating your children, mm, mm, mm. so that you should don't 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 listen to it. Don't just make sure you know what you're doing mm. and just stick to it and you know follow it through. Hallelujah. Yeah, that's something I just take out from listening to. Praise you. God, praise God, Hallelujah. Femi. Oh. Praise the Lord. Um, I think um, in addition to what Dad has um, said regarding um, Sister. Sister Stella's um, question. Yeah. Um, recently, I think Pastor gave me an opportunity to listen to to this book, and um, the number one, I think, chapter one says, which is in Proverbs twenty-two, which says, um, Train up a child the way it should go, and he said, the way it should go, not that the way it would go, and you know, one, I, and I was. Um, watching a program on the TV recently, and um, it was a movie anyway, and um, the child was being, you know, bullied, pushed, and all those in school. And the parent said, let me fight for you. And the child said, no, you want me, they go, you're going to embarrass me, and things like that. But however, in her mind, she's already going on the wrong path to handle those things. She's already succumbing to those pressure, pressure of adding to those things. And what came to my mind was that the way they should go, not the way they would go. You need to act for your children. You need to fight for them. Even, even if they don't want you to do it, it is your responsibility as a parent to fight for them. Don't worry about whether you're going to, they're going to be ashamed or anything. You are doing the right thing. You are fighting for them. It is one of your responsibility to do it. Don't care about what your children are thinking about. Fight for them, and the result is always good. You know, when, when you when you look at those situations and you read all these stories, you see children being bullied. I was reading a story where a child was bullied to an extent that he committed suicide. If his or her parent had fought for him, ignoring whatever things that he's saying. The child might probably be still be alive today. So as a parent, I'm employing us. It's our responsibility to act for them. Even if they don't like it, act for them. It's our responsibility and fight for them even when they don't want to. Praise the Lord. Okay, Debbie. Praise the Lord. Okay. Um, the point I picked up on was the importance of prayer. And what the speaker said was that prayer... Is the best weapon to use in every every difficulty and the surest re- remedy, which I believe is true. It's something that I re- believe that is helpful and useful, even in my own life. That I've had to use it in difficult um, situations. It's also one of the things that is able to, regardless of how small, how old the child is, that will bring the family together. You may not have the time to maybe sit and talk, but it's one thing that everyone agrees on. Let us pray. Let us pray. Um, I'll give an example as well, the importance of prayer. My godson, the mom and dad, they always pray for him, even before he eats. Now, going to nursery, they're not going to do that. So she realized every time she came to the school, his pat lunch was still inside. Why? Because he's expected to put his hands together and pray. And they weren't doing that with him. So it's really good and it's important that even as well, even if you can't pray as a family, it's something your child will remember when, we, when they're doing something, that this is what we used to do as a family and they will pray. May God bless his word. Praise God. Uh, in addition to that, one, by the grace of God, we'll continue to pray for, for our children, our youths, and our things in Jesus' name. In addition to what Uncle Femi said, when we don't act for our children, which was one of the points um, the speaker made, uh, that we should act for our children, the danger of us not acting for our children is, is that they will act for themselves. You understand? She's here, so I'm not going to say it. But um, I, I noticed one thing. 
you understand? When children act for themselves, they don't always act the right way. You understand? So um, you, we are to children. We are to ins children do what we inspect, not what what we expect. In relating that to acting on their behalf is when issues are going on and we um, we let them we, we they say don't 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 deal with it, mom. I, I will do it, do it myself. And then you leave them to deal with it themselves, and they don't deal with it the right way. It comes back to haunt them. You understand? And that's what we don't want as parents. So we want to fight for our children. We want to act for them. You understand? Because that age, they're going to outgrow that age. You understand? You don't want um, um, that age to affect them for the next stage they're moving to. So may God help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Okay. Um, Mommy Flora. Praise so, Lord. Yes, yes. Yeah. Actually, where actually the stick out to me was uh, that prayer, prayer be like, you know, that if we can allow our children to, you know, hear us pray, and mm. let them hear us pray. <clears throat> it's very important because in my own case, my children, although not all of them are in church today, but they had me pray. Mm. Sometimes when they were younger and we were all in the same house. They used to wake up in the morning and ask me, Mommy, did you sleep? When we were going to bed, we had you pray. This morning, we had you pray. Did you sleep at all? So I tell them, yes, yeah, that is the only bit I can do. I know I can do that. You know, I'm oh, praying yeah. for the family. And uh, what stick to them again, even though they're not in church, some of them, Psalm 91, because I taught them, I said, even though you don't do... You can pray. Always remember oh, that yeah. chapter. And uh, it, it was funny because uh, we went to we went to my first son's house the other day. And um, when I walked to his, you know, enter his room, that's Psalm 91. He's opened it mm -hmm. like that near his bed. So he said, whenever he feel like prayer, he feel like praying or it's in need of prayer. It's always pray, you know, that prayer. So prayer is very important, you know, to teach our children because it stick with them. They, you know, they can. When whenever we are together, sometimes I may forget, but before we leave their house, if I visit them, oh, mom, can we have a can we have a word of prayer? So that prayer is very important to let them teach them that you know they need prayer. They need prayer in their lives. And God will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Just on, on that point, it is vital that you model, okay, because modeling, the, the, later on you'll see where it says that children do more of what they see than what they hear, okay? And it is vital that you model whatever you want them to live out. You must model it. Whether you like it or not, you're modeling to them. Yeah? And as you model those things so that whatever it is that you desire, <clears throat> make sure they see it, make sure they hear it, make sure they, they're able to observe it, and so on. And then this, there's a further part you go to where you say, copy me. You know? That's why many times in church, when I see children sitting down, I say, my friends, sit properly. When it's time to pray, stand up. Don't sit down there. Oh yeah, follow me. Sometimes I've said, hold my jacket. Oh yeah, if I'm going up, you're going up. Just, just be repeating. Just whatever. If I'm praying in tongues, you too. Just be praying in tongues. Okay. If you don't know what to say, Daddy, I don't know what. Just repeat what I'm saying, and just do what I'm doing. Yeah. You know what? Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Little children, my little who, Bible says something very interesting in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1. It says be imitators of God. Are we together? Yeah. Jesus Christ said something and which is one of the things I want to share with us at the very beginning. If you look at John chapter 5 he says whatever the father does eh, that is what me as a son I'm doing. So the, And he says the father shows the son everything that he's doing. And so the son in turn also does whatever he sees the father doing. 
Yeah? So there is a conscious, I don't know what to pray. Just whatever you hear me, take. then, okay, take your Bible. Hold the Bible. Whatever it is in, teaching them, modeling him. We take the word and we use the word and we begin to use it to pray. Eh, eh, hold on. Go back again. Go back. Eh, eh. Don't, don't stop there. Louder. Lift up your voice. And you see, you're deliberately with intentionality. It may seem difficult today. But over time, it begins to enter. Learning to release their spirit for the things of God. Let me tell you the truth. Anything good requires cultivation. Anything bad requires you to do nothing. You know. So it's important that we understand these truths and we're very intentional about it. There must be high level of intentionality and the next word is visibility. Yeah? Be visible about your walk with God. And be very intentional about it. You know, because they're watching you, they're observing, and as a matter of time, they will also ap adopt the things. You see, I didn't realize how much my parents, especially, my, you know, had influenced me because my mother would always make sure that I went with her to choir rehearsal. I didn't understand. You know, the other day I said to JJ that interesting thing is my mom always did two things. She would sing and she'll always be tapping her finger. Even while she's driving, my mom is singing. She'll be singing, singing, everywhere she is. She'll be singing and she'll be tapping her nails on the steering wheel on places. Gigi said to me, you know what? That's just exactly like grandma in America. She does the same. Gigi had also observed that she used to do the same thing. So I as a son, I saw it and I copied it. JJ, my, now her grandson has seen her. So JJ said, that's exactly like grandma. Singing and tapping away. And so, you know. So by fire, by force, you went to church. Even if you are dead, they make a coffin and carry you to church. Because you had to go. You know. And, and that was just it. You know, you just did not, not go to church. You know. And, of course, typically, everybody is sitting in a row. And you know what? You, you, you twitch and everything. My dad would just look at you like this. And he wouldn't say anything. That I meant. <laughs> Carry on. I'll meet you when we get home. You know? And it taught divine order in the presence and the house of God. You know? Because everything that is good must be taught. You know, it must be learned and it must be taught. And after a while, by the grace of God, they take ownership of it in their own lives. Yeah? Never say, they're little children, it's okay, don't worry. No, let me tell you, you say that and you know what will happen? Sit down and take advantage of it. You know? Have you noticed when babies are, are breastfeeding, if they bite you, you don't do anything about it. They will bite you again and bite you again and keep on. Then from biting, they will come to slapping you. Eh? And if you don't stop it, eh? is it just a little charge? Just a little charge. Wait, at 16 years old, they will still be slapping you. You know? So you immediately, eh? <laughs> <laughs> you deal with it and let it be known that I will not make empty threats. You know what? I will execute what I'm saying very clearly. You know, and to the point that now you can use your eyes to talk to your children without you saying very much. You know, very important. Praise God. Yeah. Okay. It's been a wonderful evening, isn't it? Yeah. A lot for us to learn, a lot for us to grow. By the grace of God, tomorrow we shall carry on, okay? In Jesus' name, I pray, hallelujah, okay, that because we have been partakers of this, our children and our grandchildren, you might be here tonight and maybe, you know what, you say, oh, well, I'm a grandparent now, you know, it hasn't been so, but you still have grandchildren who are coming, amen? 
and you still have an opportunity to, even if it's not your physical child, you know what, you can adopt another child and say, God, help me, whatever it is that I've missed along the way. You know what, you may miss it with one generation, but you shouldn't miss it with a second generation. And for those who are here, we begin to look at ways, Lord, teach me, show me, guide me. I want to encourage everybody to get that book. It's called The Duties of Parents, okay? Interesting enough, you can actually download it online from, you know. And then there's another book called Parents Rising, okay? Write it down, Parents Rising, okay? It is the follow-up to this book, okay? Parents Rising, all right? Um, very important book. It's a more modern edition, okay? Parents Rising, okay? So that you make sure you listen to it and it begins to give you, it deals with things like the internet, how to, you know, raising girls, boys, all the sort of things and so on, yeah? Uh, very practical things. Very, very practical things, okay? Hallelujah. And by the grace of God, we're going to pray now and as the Lord directed yesterday to anoint, hallelujah, so that God will refresh us, renew our strength, hallelujah, for the journey that lies ahead, hallelujah. And by the grace of God, God will give you the wisdom, the knowledge and the understanding to be able to raise children who will stand in the courts of God, amen, who will be able to serve before God. Daniel chapter 1 verse 4 and 5, who will stand in the king's court and minister to the Lord of lords. Amen. Hallelujah. Let us rise up together. Praise Jehovah. Father, we thank you. Let us pray. Let us pray. Let us pray. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Father, Lord God, we thank you for such a time like this. We bless you, Father, because you have brought us here. Thank you for the entrance of your words. Thank you, Father, for this teaching tonight. Thank you for from the beginning to the end, oh Lord, oh, that has been you, oh Lord. We thank you, oh Lord, God, for the miracles that this will bear, oh Lord, God, in our families, in raising our children, oh Lord, God. Father, you have taught us that our first assignment is to raise godly children. The how, the when, the where, the how, the who, how we're going to do it. You are going, you're, you're, you're teaching us through this conference. Father, we thank you, oh Lord, God. That you that you have started this great work, you are more than able to complete in the lives of our children. That we will not do things, O oh Lord God, in our own understanding. That in every way and in every situation, we will seek you. You will, you will give us direction. You will help us, O oh Lord God. You will help us, O oh Lord God. You will open our eyes of understanding. Not to do things in our own way, but to do things the way according to your will, O oh Lord God. Father, this is our prayer as a church. Father, this is our prayer as individuals. This is our prayers, O oh Lord God, as parents, O oh Lord God. Parents that will raise children, that, that, will, that your hearts will be glad, O oh Lord God, when you see them. That when we have gone, O oh Lord God, Father, this generation will not suffer for our own mistakes, O oh Lord God. The things might look that they're not working now, O oh Lord God, but you know, O oh Lord God, that you said we should continue, we should persist. We should insist, we should do, we should lose, use everything within our reach, O oh Lord, to do that which you have told us to do. Father, the, 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 the capability, O oh Lord God, you've given unto us, cause us to walk in that obedience, O Lord. You said when we obey you, things will go well, and it will go according to your plan and purpose for us. Father, the grace to obey fully, O oh Lord God, in all that you have committed in our hands, O oh Lord. Father, we ask for the grace tonight, O oh Lord. Thank you, Father, King of Glory, for you have done it indeed. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' much less name we have prayed. Jesus. Let's just remain in the attitude of prayer tonight. There's so much that has been said already. Hallelujah.
Lord, we thank you tonight. We, we bless your name, O oh God. Lord, we come to confess, O oh God, our need, our need even tonight, O oh God. We've come to confess, O oh Lord God, that it's only you that can make us that parent that you want us to be, O oh God. That it's only in your strength, O oh God, that we can fully carry out our responsibility. Father, so we come with humility tonight. We come with humility tonight. See, whenever a man knows what God requires, it always humbles them. Say, so Lord, tonight, O oh Lord, we are humble when we see what you require of us, O oh God. To raise children, O oh God, that are Christ-like. He said, my children for whom I labor until Christ is formed. Oh, that's a tall order. Until Christ is formed. Say, Lord, I need you, I need you, I need you. You see, the moment a man realizes what God needs, what God requires, God's righteous requires. In fact, even David, when God told him what he required, David said, not, not my home, not a man like me, except by your grace. So, Lord Jesus, we've discovered what you require, oh God, to raise children. Paul said, my children, I labor again. He had labored the first time. He labored again so that Christ may be formed. Father, Lord, in our seed, may Christ be formed. Can you lift up your voice and cry out to God? That in our children, may Christ be formed, oh God. Lord, may none of us fail in this assignment, oh God. Lord, when we present before you on that day, oh God, may, oh Lord God, by your mercy, may it be that, oh Lord, your grace has helped us, oh God. Then may, if Jesus said, well done, faithful servant, well done, faithful parent, we say, no, Lord, not I, but your grace has enabled us in the name of Jesus. Can we cry out? Can we cry out even tonight? Say, Lord, we cry out as a people, we cry out as a church. The reason why we have gathered is so that you may help us. The reason why we have gathered is so that we may outline, Lord God, your righteous standard, your righteous requirement. Father, please help us, O Lord, that we may rest, O Lord, godly offspring, O God. Lord, that we may raise, O God, children whom Christ has fully been formed, whom the maturity, the full stature of Christ has been made manifest, O Lord. Lord, please help us, O God. Help us, our God. Lord, tonight we confess our weakness. We confess our weakness. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. You know, Paul said, now I delight in my weakness. Say, because I know that when I'm weak, he is made strong. Hallelujah. Say, now I delight in my weakness. He said, now I delight in my weakness. Because I know that when I am weak, he is made strong. Why don't you talk to God? Why don't you talk to God? There might be area we saw that outline the different things, the different areas or wherever there's a challenge, wherever there's a struggle. Except if there's anybody who is already a perfect parent here, then you don't need to pray because you got it all. But if you, if there's still an area where you're saying, God, 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 I'm trusting you, even for my grown children, Lord, I'm still trusting you that even the seed that I sow many years ago, it will receive the the, the rain. They will receive the rain and the breath of God and those trees will sprout alive. Even those moments when they were toddlers, when they were teenagers, when I taught them, when I taught them how to pray, how to seek your faith. Lord, I have not seen the full manifestation of those seeds yet. Lord, I'm still trusting that your rain will come upon my effort, oh God. Lord, I'm still trusting you. I'm believing you, oh God. I'm believing you, Jehovah God. That it's only by you, oh God. That the labor of my hand, the labor of my parent in my comfort, oh God. Lord Jesus, we cry out to you even tonight, oh God. We cry out to you with your people. We are trusting you, oh God, that we will not fail in this assignment, oh God. Father, please help us, oh God, as household. Help us, oh God, as fathers. Help us, oh God, as mothers, oh God. Lord, when we look at our children and we look at your standard, we know there's still a variation. We know there's still a wide gulf. We know there's still a differential. Lord, we are trusting you, oh God. We come to cry at your feet, you oh God. We've come to cry at your feet that you will help us, oh God. Even when we look at our little ones, oh God, we say, what a tall order. How can Christ be fully formed inside of this world? How can Christ be fully formed inside of this world? Father, we say, Lord, we need your help, oh God. 
We gather together tonight, oh Lord, with humility of heart, oh God. Crying out to you, Jehovah God. Because you are the perfect parent. That's why you say, our father woman in heaven. You are the father, you are the perfect parent. You are the only one who has raised a perfect son, Jesus Christ. Lord, so we say, help us, oh God. Help us, oh God. The Bible says, by this, you become a partaker of, eh, of divine nature. Father, Lord, we learn earlier Lord, that parenting is partnership with you, oh God. Lord, help us, oh Lord God, to be those partners, oh God. Those who have come to partner with you by faith, oh Jehovah God. Father, I cry out tonight, oh God. Even for myself, oh God, I cry out tonight, oh God. <laughs> For the life and the destiny of the children that you have entrusted in me. Parenting is a trust. Father, Lord, help us not to fail in this trust in the name of Jesus. Lord, this is our cry tonight. That's why we have gathered, oh God. We gather here with humility, oh God. We gather here crying out to you, Jehovah God. We gather here seeking your help, seeking your face, oh God. We gather here, oh God. Lord, that you may help us, oh God. Now let's begin to pray for our children, our children natural, our children biological, our children adopted. Let's begin to speak into their life now. Let's begin to speak into their life. Let's begin to speak into their life that the reign of God will come upon them. The Bible says the land that is constantly being rained upon. Lord, we pray to you, oh God, over our children, oh God. We say, let your grace reign upon them, oh God. place why don't you call the name of your children why don't you call the name of your children why don't you cry out to God why don't you present them before God why don't you say God Lord even Lord God for my son oh God even Lord God for my daughter oh God why don't you call them by name before his grace Jesus we thank you because you are here then the last chapter we, 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 we read, it said not to forsake the means of public grace. That we should teach them that when the people of God gather together, that Christ is in a means in a special way. Say, Jesus, I know you are here in a special way. Lord Jesus, we know you are here in a special way. Say, Lord, please touch my seed of God. Touch my offspring, oh Lord. Touch the child of my loins, oh God. Lord Jesus, touch all of the child of my womb, oh God. Lord, this is our prayer tonight, oh God. Say, Lord, please open the heart of my child to, to receive you, oh God. Open their spirit to receive you, oh God. Lord, we declare, Lord God, that we are the children that you have given to us, that we belong to you, that we are for signs and for we are for wonders, oh God. Lord, we cry out to you, oh God, that your spirit, oh God, is open to you, to your, to your word, oh God. We declare, Lord God, that every barrier, oh God, oh Lord God, in the life of our children, we declare them removed, oh God. Lord, we place our feet in the Jordan so that our children Children can come through, oh God. Lord, if there's one area we don't want to fail, we don't want to fail you. The Bible says, Why did he make them two? Because he desired a godly offspring. Lord, we pray to your God that our children shall be godly offspring. In the name of Jesus. Father, Lord, we pray, oh God, for everyone who is present here, for even those who are not here, oh God, for every member of this congregation, oh Lord, that, Lord, you begin to do a work deep, oh Lord God, in this congregation, in the name of Jesus. None of our seed will be lost, oh God. Father, this is our prayer tonight, oh God. This is our heart cry, oh God. Father, we thank you. We give you the praise. 
We give you all the glory, O oh God. Lord, as we teach them your ways, O oh God. Lord, give them a heart, O oh God. Cause that the heart of our children will not be barren. Cause that their heart will not be, not be unfruitful, O oh God. Lord, this is our prayer tonight, O oh God. Lord, as parents, O oh God, Father, please help us. Help us, O oh God. Lord, we need you, we need you, we need you. We need you, we need you, we need you. We need you, O oh God. That we will carry out, O oh Lord God, all your righteous requirements concerning our children, O oh God. So that they will turn out right, O oh God, before you, O oh Lord, in your own standard. Lord, this is our prayer tonight. Thank you for this parenting weekend, O oh God. Thank you, Lord, for all you have been speaking to our heart. Thank you for all the grace that you have been freely stirring in our midst, our God. Father, we bless you tonight. We honor you tonight. We give you glory, our God. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Most High God. We give you glory, our God. Hallelujah. 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 Bless you, Pastor T. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. We're just going to do something crucial. If you, you can just put that scripture in Daniel chapter 1, verse 4, 3, 4. Hallelujah. 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 Something the Lord said to me was this. What you don't prophesy will not happen. The Bible says, watch this. Before you put Daniel chapter 4, okay? Hebrews 11, okay? Verse 3. What does it say? Hebrews 11 verse 3. It says, by faith we understand that the worlds during the successive ages were what? Framed, fashioned, put in order, and equipped for their intended purpose by what? The word of God. Hallelujah. So that what we see was not made out of things which, were, which are visible. They were made by the words that were spoken. Are we together? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, there's a difference between prayer, oh God, this, thank God for prayer, asking. But let me say something, there's something that's higher than prayer, and it is prophesying. Yeah, and that is something that if you don't catch this truth, I pray you'll understand this truth tonight. There is something that is higher than prayer of request. That is what prophetic prayer that is speaking into being, prophesying those things, speaking them. Jesus Christ, or rather, let me say, God, when he saw the earth was empty, was void without, he did not put in a prayer request. He just said, let there be. And there was. Hallelujah. And God said to me that we must learn how to speak prophetically into the life of our children. Speak it prophesy it. It may not be as it is now, but the God who speaks and brings those things that are not into being, those things that do not appear to be, but when you keep on speaking it, I say you will serve the Lord. You will stand before kings. Hallelujah. You will stand before the great. Hallelujah. And not before the obscure. And you begin to prophesy it and declare and decree it. Hallelujah. As you're doing so, the Bible says you begin to frame, you begin to fashion, you begin to put into order, you begin to equip for their intended purpose. What is the purpose? Daniel chapter 1 from verse 3. Hallelujah. Let me tell you, saints of God, these things, they work. It, th th this thing works. That is why if you, if you have a look at my Bible, I have books and books about prophetic praying and the promises of God. You know what? We take those things 
And you know, sometimes when JJ is sleeping, you just lay hands upon him and speak. So I just say, go to your mom. Or oh, yeah, I'll tell my wife, even if I'm not home, darling, open so so page. So 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 use it prophetically to pray over his lay hands upon him so that he has understood so many things that we see many things that are happening they're not things that that just happen accidentally they're things that were prophesied and keep on prophesying continuously Daniel, it says, and the Babylonian king told Asphenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring in some of the children of Israel, both of the royal family and of Nubi, youths without what? Blemish. Well favored in appearance and skillful in all wisdom, discernment and understanding, apt in learning knowledge and competent to stand where? And serve in the king's palace. And to what? Teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. How do you take that? You declare it and you say, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah. You shall be without blemish, hallelujah. You will be well favored in appearance. You shall be skillful in all wisdom. My seed, our seed, hallelujah. That is what God is saying to you to raise, hallelujah. Shall what? In discernment and in understanding. What? Apt in learning knowledge. You shall be competent to stand and to serve. In the king's palace. Hallelujah. Amen. In the name of Jesus, I will teach you and you will learn the literature and the language of the kingdom of God, of heaven. Hallelujah. And it becomes a prophetic declaration. That is the responsibility of parents. That is what God is asking you to do. That you will raise children. Hallelujah. Who will be without blemish. What an assignment. Children who will be well favored in appearance and in skillful in wisdom and discernment. And tonight in the name of Jesus, the Lord will anoint you. Hallelujah. So that by the time you're done, your children will stand to minister in the king's palace. Father, tonight... As we gather in this place, O oh God, be it unto your children, Lord God, according to their confession and their faith. You have been listening to a message recorded from the Redeemed Christian Church of God, International Christian Center, Chadwa Eve. If you need copies of this message, please call the church office on 0208-859-00789 or 0208-59-77111 or email us at media at icc-rccg.org. Please find further details about this ministry at www.icc-rccg.org God bless.